Now, from Wish TV, your local news source, this is All Indiana Politics. Good morning and welcome to All Indiana Politics. I'm Garrett Bergquist. We're talking again this morning about the future of abortion in Indiana after the Supreme Court Dobbs decision. A federal judge has allowed a state 2019 state law to take effect, banning a second trimester abortion procedure. We're now two weeks away from the special legislative session where Republicans are expected to pass some type of abortion ban for the state. For now, the debate on what the bill will look like has been behind closed doors. And joining us now is Jim Bopp, General Counsel for the National Right to Life Committee. Jim, thank you for joining us. Do you want to see Indiana enact a total ban on abortion, even no exceptions for rape or incest? Well, that's the goal of the pro-life the goal of the pro-life movement is to outlaw abortion except to save the life of the mother. So that's obviously not a total ban. And if the legislature wants uh, to include rape and incest. That is a pro-life position as far as the rights life movement is concerned, and uh, that will be their choice. But our goal, our uh, ideal, is life of the mother only, uh, because we don't think you should devalue the lives of people based on the sins of the father, the, the rape or the incest. And uh, even though we understand what a difficult situation that is. What do you say to those who argue that outlawing abortion will only drive it underground and make it even more dangerous? Well, uh, uh, you know, look, look, there's going to be a million arguments uh, that will be made against these sorts of laws. And of course, the reality is, uh, is that for 150 years, uh, Indiana, as well as the entire United States, allowed abortion only to save the life of the mother. So we have an experience with that, with this. And the situations like you just described are extremely rare. And of course, uh, with modern medicine, penicillin and all of the uh, things that are now available, uh, uh, it is highly unlikely that abortion will be more dangerous if committed illegally. But and the reality is currently, abortion clinics are not even regulated. So if, you, if you're concerned about unregulated clinics, that's exactly what we have today in the United States at the insistence of the abortion industry uh, under Roe v. Wade. So uh, to the extent there'll be illegal abortion clinics shielded by like radical Democrat prosecutors like in Marion County, Indiana, uh, uh, there'll be essentially illegal abortion clinics shielded by him uh, who will operate unregulated, but that's exactly how they're operating now unregulated. Have you had any conversations with Indiana lawmakers about what they're considering? Well, I'm not at liberty to discuss that. Uh, we have prepared a, a national right to life, prepared a model law. We, of course, represent in Indiana right to life, and I'm a lawyer in Terre Haute, Indiana, so I'm particularly interested in Indiana. And uh, that, that model has been circulated to all the state groups throughout the United States, including the Indiana uh, right to life, and then they have submitted that to the uh, legislature for consideration. So uh, it'll, I'm sure, be considered in a number of states. Should Indiana make it illegal for someone to cross state lines to obtain an abortion? Even Justice Kavanaugh said that could violate the Constitution. Well, I think if, it's, if the purpose is to avoid parental knowledge and, and it's a minor daughter uh, and the purpose of transporting the child for what would it be an illegal abortion here in Indiana across state lines, that violates parental rights. So that, that is certainly a circumstance uh, that uh, where the law of Indiana could protect parents uh, from a transport of their minor daughter uh, without their knowledge. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I don't think that in terms of adults uh, that you could uh, prevent uh, adult women from uh, going uh, to uh, to another state. Are you concerned at all about any corporate blowback? Companies deciding that because of extremely restrictive abortion laws, they might decide not to locate or relocate to Indiana? Well, I, you know, I've learned a long time ago that big corporations should not be the ones that control our politics and our lives. Uh, and it's really ironic that the liberals, who, who I thought 
didn't like big corporations are now entrenched in them and, and getting them, try, trying to get them uh, to, uh, to run roughshod over the people to determine public policy. Uh, I'm not for that. Uh, the, uh, there, uh, but I think it's, uh, in terms of what, if they would really do that, it's highly, highly unlikely that they, uh, would determine where they, uh, where, where they reside or where their plants are based upon the ab abortion laws of, of that particular state. I mean, after all, the people that run these corporations are just interested in, in the bottom line, the big cash, uh, their profits, and, uh, you know, they, they honestly don't care. Justice Clarence Thomas wrote in a concurring opinion that based on the Dobbs ruling, it might be time to take a look at some of the Supreme Court's other past substantive due process cases, the ones that legalize same-sex marriage, same-sex relationships, and access to contraception, for example. Do you want the court to go back and take another look at those cases? No. Uh, the, uh, and with respect to Thomas's uh, concurrent, uh, last I checked, it takes five votes of the Supreme Court to do anything. And nobody joined his opinion. And in fact, the Dobbs opinion applied substantive due process. I mean, he just thinks in the future, well, maybe we ought to take a look at that. He's been saying that actually for years, decades, uh, that he doesn't like substantive due process. Uh, no one seems to be going along with it. And uh, so I don't see that as a real concern. Jim Bob, thank you for joining us. So Republican lawmakers still plan to gather on July 25th for a special session. That didn't stop Democrats from gathering on the original start day of July 6th. They called on Republicans to focus on economic relief, not abortion restrictions. Today, we should be here at the Indiana State House discussing how we can bring relief to Hoosier taxpayers. But we are not doing that. Why? Most likely because behind closed doors somewhere, there is a discussion about how do we link not only taxpayer refunds and benefits, but how do we impose something on women that will restrict their right to make choices for themselves and their families. So as in typical fashion, it's a bait and switch. Even as we stand here, they're preparing to pass a bill that will not only strip women of personhood and privacy, but would pass the cost of their moral crusade onto already overburdened taxpayers. Indiana will likely face down hundreds of millions, if not billions, in new costs as a result of abortion bans. And the supermajority is more than happy to leave you with the bill. Governor Eric Holcomb originally called the special session for inflation relief. He and Republican leaders delayed the start to craft legislation in response to the Supreme Court's abortion ruling. Abortion rights protesters picketed for hours outside the State House on the original start date. House Speaker Todd Houston's office told News 8 it cannot release any details about what to expect. Have any of you uh, spoken with your counterparts on the other side of the aisle? How, how have those conversations gone regarding either A, abortion, or B, the inflation relief package? Well, I have talked to my colleague on the other side of the aisle who is over health to get an idea of just um, how extreme we're going to be as it relates to this um, health care matter. And I have gotten the understanding that it is an important issue to their caucus and to expect something, uh, and very likely it will go to the health committee. So uh, I do believe something is looming out there. We do not know what it is, what it looks like, what's contained within it, um, but uh, we are gearing up for what I expect to be a real fight on that topic. Coming up, we bring in Indiana's best political team to talk the special session, next on All Indiana Politics. Welcome back to All Indiana Politics as we welcome in two members of our political panel, Republican Tom John and Democrat Kip Two. Tom, let's start with you. Republicans aren't saying much about their abortion bill. We do have the boilerplate language from the National Right to Life Committee. How much appetite is there for banning abortions even in the case of rape or incest? 
Well, I think that's the wrong way to approach it as far as banning or in what cases it'll be. I think the reason you haven't heard much is there are policy discussions that have begun and more importantly are going to begin when we get together later this month with the General Assembly. I think they're looking at the various aspects of this. They're looking at a change in law that, you know, 50 years coming. And there's a lot of things that were frankly esoteric questions that became very real and they're being thoughtful about how they approach them. On Friday, President Joe Biden signed an executive order directing federal agencies to protect access to abortion services. That includes abortion medications, for example. Kip, how much does this offset any legislative action here in Indiana? Well, it, it remains to be seen. Don't We don't know, uh, as, as Tom uh, eloquently pointed out, we don't know exactly what is coming out of it. And, and uh, He's just right about the fact that it was an esoteric argument. And when you have to get into the details um, of uh, some of these restrictions that are being contemplated, uh, the devil is truly in the details. For example, if uh, the life of the mother is an exception, who makes the decision? And does a prosecutor uh, look over the shoulder of a doctor who has to make that decision? That's going to be a very sticky wicket, very difficult uh, 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 drafting of legislation with respect to that and the thing that you point out with respect to the day after pill or or um, other medication uh, abor to, to facilitate abortion and how are they going to be how is that going to be treated all of those details are very difficult to iron out as we move from uh, a, a place where abortion was legal in every state to folks having to actually confront what that actually means this is a question for both of you. How much do Republicans risk overreaching on this and paying the price in November? Tom, I'll start with you. Well, I think that's one of the things that uh, people are taking input right now to understand what their voters really do want. I think you, even depending on where you are in the state, may have different opinions. And I think that's a lot of the discussion going on right now is what does it mean to voters? It really is something that even before May, nobody really thought was a possibility. And certainly there is risk in whatever approach they take that certain voters will be upset, certain voters will be very happy, and how that plays out, I think, is an open question. Kip, what's your read? So, yeah, so we had a test case here in Indiana uh, not that long ago, the Joe Donnelly versus Richard Murdoch case. And folks may may recall that Richard Murdoch basically took the position that was uh, in the Republican state platform. Um, and he, he he accidentally told the truth on, in a debate and it, it he lost. And a lot of people attribute his losing uh, to that extreme position. So I'm not sure that uh, Hoosier voters have changed their position on um, uh, when abortion ought to be legal, for example, rape, incest, or to protect the life of a mother. I think the majority of Hoosiers are still there. Every poll I've seen uh, uh, statewide in the state of Indiana says voters support uh, those exceptions for sure, and and we're comfortable with Roe v. Wade as it was. So it's going to be very interesting to see uh, how the Republicans try to thread a needle that the public is not in favor of here in the state of Indiana. We got about 45 seconds left. Briefly, does President Biden's order mobilize the Republican base in the same way abortion bans would mobilize Democrats? Tom, you're up first. Um, I think you will see certainly elements and certainly core elements of the Republican Party that will be motivated by that and understand what that means and what that brings to the Senate and the House races throughout the country this year and what that leadership in those bodies would mean vis-a-vis -vis this decision by the president. All right. Kip, I'll give you the last word on this one. I don't think it's going to have any effect. I think the voters who are anti-abortion uh, are going to come out and vote and continue to vote. They are, they've always been pretty reliable voters for the Republican Party, so I think it has no effect on those voters. All right, so coming up, our panel discussion will continue with a look at the new jobs report. Welcome back to All Indiana Politics as we welcome back Republican Tom John and Democrat Kip Tu. Let's turn to the economy. The new jobs report shows we added jobs last month. Gas prices have now dropped for 21 straight days. Does President Biden deserve more credit than he's getting for this? Tom, we'll start with you. 
Uh, no, I mean, just because things have gone from completely awful to slightly worse or slightly less awful doesn't mean that it's a good thing. The fact is the Biden administration's energy policies are what got us to gas prices in the first place. The fact is the out of control spending by Congress has exacerbated problems with inflation. And now we have paradoxically a disappointment in the job numbers insofar as now we're going to be looking at an economy that the Fed is going to have to continue feeding hard medicine to. Kip, what do you think? Well, uh, on, on, on this one, I'm going to completely disagree with Tom, of course. Um, it, when, when anything's bad, it's, it's uh, apparently the president's fault. When anything's good, he doesn't deserve any of the credit. Uh, that's just sort of the way things go, I suppose. But, I mean, let's just talk about inflation for a moment. Uh, England, you know, they, they just kicked out their, their prime minister. Uh, their inflation was out of control. Turkey's inflation is 75%. So if you're judging us by other uh, countries, the American inflation problem is less than they are there. Gas prices, um, uh, most Republicans used to think that a president doesn't have anything to do with gas prices, but suddenly when a Democrat's in office, it's the Democrats' responsibility to uh, control gas prices. And we all know, because we can see, that the major um, uh, oil companies in, in the world have made record profits over the last few quarters. So they are taking money out of our wallets. It's not Joe Biden. I want to focus on a couple of interesting metrics that were in that report. Labor force participation is still about a percentage point below February 2020 levels. People not in the labor force but who want a job still higher. We've been basically holding steady at that for some time. For both of you, at both the state and federal levels, what should we be doing to reach those workers? Well, boy, that's an excellent question. I mean, part of the part of the you know issue coming out of the pandemic is that uh, people have taken a different approach to work um, and have reassessed their lives and the importance of of work in their lives and trying to figure out how to balance all those things. And I think that's part of what's going on in the economy. Uh, I, one of the things that I noticed from that report is that um, non-government jobs have actually uh, uh, gone past 2020 levels and the government hiring is what's lagging behind more than anything else as governments have not uh, uh, state and local and federal government has not hired at, at a rate that was consistent in 2020. And that's really where the, the weakness in the job numbers were. Um, and some people would say that's a strength because we're not, you know, we're not expanding government, but we are expanding private enterprise. Tom, what do you think from a policy perspective? What should we be doing at the state and federal level on this? Well, I think this gets into there's the Kip. I don't disagree really with anything that Kip's just said, but one of the other things is we need as a as a state a community a nation to continue to really work to ensure that people are trained for the jobs that are out there i think there's some level of people who've chosen not to do jobs that are available and some of those jobs are going to be replaced by automation but on the flip side we also need to ensure that people have the skills for the jobs that are out there of which there are many that go unfilled every day here in indiana and throughout the nation So final question for both of you, true or false, the economy and inflation will be the biggest issues in November. Tom, your call. People vote their pocketbooks, and that is always a time-tested rule, and we can talk about everything else, but are you better off than you were X years before? And I think right now people don't feel like they're better off than they were before 2020. And I think that because the Democrats have complete control of government in Washington, D.C., you're going to see. Tom, a we got to give uh, Kip a chance to get in the last word here. Yeah, that was the longest seconds. true false answer I've ever heard, Tom. False. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Thank you both for joining us. We'll be back in a moment. Take all Indiana politics on the go with you. Download our podcast now. Part of the All Indiana Podcast Network and allindianapodcastnetwork.com. Thank you for joining us for All Indiana Politics. We'll be back here next Sunday morning at 930. And you can also find our brand new All Indiana Politics podcast. It's part of the All Indiana Podcast Network at wishtv.com. Have a great rest of your weekend.